praise you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord God, and it is so good to be in the presence of God. To feel that love, Lord God, surround us. To feel the encouragement that we so desperately need. To feel your presence, Lord God, as it moves in our lives and as it brings change. God, to know that you are in control, that you speak to us, Lord, and there's never been a time more in our lives, probably, than we need to hear from you, Lord God. And so, Father, we come before you this morning with an expectation that, Lord, that you would move amongst us in every home, in every seat that's listening today, Lord God, that you would touch their lives, that you would change them forevermore. That, God, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of unknowns, God, in the midst of losses of jobs and and issues with family members, God, it, it, it gets overwhelming sometimes. But, Lord, we know we come to you. We know you're a good father, and we know that you love us. And so, Lord, this morning, I just pray that each one of us would just surrender everything we're dealing with right now to you. That, God, we would lay it down. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how small it is. God, you care about everything we do. So, God, I pray right now that those that are suffering from losing their job, Lord, that you would find work for them, Lord God, that you would give them peace. Those that are sick, Lord God, that you would heal them. God, those that have children that are lost, that you would bring them back, that you would restore them. That, God, those that just need a touch from you, they feel dry and weary and worn out. That, God, that your Holy Spirit would fill them and renew inside of them, God, a strength they haven't felt before. God, nothing we're dealing with is too big for you. Nothing we are confronted with is too big for you. And so, God, we surrender it to you today, Lord God, and we say, Lord, have your way in our lives. And sometimes we say those words, Lord God, in our heart. We just maybe can't quite get ourselves to believe that we really mean it. So, God, this morning I pray that you would bring our heart and our mind in alignment as we say, God, we surrender to you. Every aspect of what we're going through, everything that we're dealing with, we lay it down today, Lord Jesus. And we ask for a fresh word from you, a touch from you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would move. Because that's why we're here, Lord Jesus. So, Father, have your way today. We honor you, we praise you, and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. little uh, break there for a second, I apologize. As you know, I tend to uh, cry a lot, which is the way things work these days. I'm going to blame it on something. Age, Pastor Danny, when he made me a pastor, that kind of triggered the the, uh, waterworks when it all started. So we'll stay with that. I apologize. Um, Anyways, good morning, Bridge. Uh, It's glad, I'm glad to be here this morning. Glad to be a part of what we're doing here at Bridge Community Church. And um, it's exciting to be together. It's exciting to know that you're listening, even though, and, and hopefully watching, but maybe more listening than watching, because that would be, you know, maybe, well, anyways, we'll get away from that point. We're glad you're there. And uh, I do want to get started this morning and say that we're talking about the people of the way. And as we began the series a couple weeks ago, you know, Pastor Danny started out and really did an amazing job of using Peter to explain to us, to show us how important it was to change our minds so that God could go ahead and change our hearts. And the following week, Pastor Andy uh, followed up and he he spoke about Paul. And in speaking about Paul, he also did an amazing job of really using Paul to express how God is able to use who we are, to take who we are, redeem it, and then to use it to further the kingdom of God. And I thought both of them just did an amazing job, and I want to just thank them for that, because they really set an interesting table as we move into week three. 
And I'm not necessarily going to pick a particular individual or person as much as I'm going to talk about some individuals, but there's more, hopefully, a theme that I'll be able to kind of create for you as we go into this. And as I was listening to Pastor Andy and Pastor Danny speak about the, the Paul and, and Peter, I began to really recognize just the complete stark contrast between the two individuals their backgrounds, their social status, who they were, where they'd grown up, how they'd come about to where they were. And it was interesting to me is, is that, you know, you know what, what began to run through my mind is, so what qualified them to be people of the way? What was it about them that made them be, become people of the way? It was interesting to me, and I apologize. I need to... Again, or bother me the rest of the service. Okay, so what, what qualified them to be people of the way? And as I thought about it, was it their character? Was it their integrity? Was it their wisdom or maybe their humility? Did they have great faith or boldness? Was it their education or their status? You know, I, I looked at it and I thought, you know, none of those really matched in a lot of ways between Peter and Paul. And so as I began to look at it, I thought, let's take a look at some of the other individuals that, that followed Jesus that we would maybe consider people of the way. And there's a, a long list of them. And, and quite frankly, I, I only picked a few. And um, I can tell you up front, and you'll, you'll get it as I go, that I probably picked a lot of them that I identified with, right? Not the good parts, but the negative parts, right? The parts that you would go, man, I wouldn't pick that guy because of that, right? So let's take a look at Peter. Uh, briefly. Uh, Peter was a fisherman, as, as was spoken about by Pastor Danny. He was a fisherman, and as a fisherman, back in that day in Galilee where he was, they really looked at the fishermen as though they were kind of uneducated, right? They, they didn't really have a good education. They didn't really know the things about the Torah and about the Bible. They weren't, they weren't brought up into the things of, of the Word of God. And they also looked at him not just un, as uneducated, but unschooled, maybe even rude or illiterate on a couple of the things that I read. So they really had a, a, a poor view of what a fisherman was. But when I, when I take a look at Peter's life and as I, I look at who Peter was, Peter was uh, I, what I would consider probably to be a type A personality, right? He was a, a go get him, take charge, uh, let, you know, full speed ahead, you know, just go for it, right? And um, what's interesting about it is, is that, you know, I, I, I took this test years ago when I was working for a, a company, and, and they had this, this the handout that they gave to everybody I worked with, and they said, okay, you know, just, it was anonymous, you know, so I didn't get to know who it was. And, and they said, so how would you describe Scott? And one of the words that I will never forget, and they, oh, and by the way, there was 13 of us in this group from different companies, and they had these big, you know, the easel, paper easel boards, and they had just words that described you. They didn't have your name, it was a question mark, so you had to find yourself, right? So I'm walking by and I'm reading something, ah, maybe, 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 and I get to this one, and in big bold letters it says, steamroller. Okay, you can, you can stop laughing. Yes, I, I knew that was me instantly, right? I'd probably been labeled that in other kind, you know, descriptive words previously, that I would come in and just, you know, take charge, roll, you know, bowl people over, get out of the way, whatever it is you got to do. And so when I take a look at who Peter was, I kind of envision him that way, larger than life, right? He walks into a room and he's he kind of just a little boisterous and, and he shouldn't be, right? Not a lot of humility in Peter in my mind, um, which I struggled with as well. So Peter comes in and here we are in Matthew 26 and it's the story where they're in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter, as the, they come to arrest Jesus, Peter chops the ear off of the servant of the high priest. I mean, that's a pretty reactive moment in time. No self-control. I know you don't believe that I have no self-control, um, but I, I, I don't, really. I haven't for many years. Um, but anyway, so he chops the ear off of the, off of the, the high priest. And, and again, it's just, it just shows you who Peter was. Uh, the next one is a very familiar passage, again, in Matthew 26, and it's the story of how Peter denies Christ three times. And this is a very somber story because what, what you recognize inside of this is is that Peter had just said, Lord, nothing, I will never let anything happen to you, right? That, that I will stand by you. And yet he couldn't even keep his own words for a few minutes, for a few sentences, right? I mean, it, it changed so quickly where he denied who Christ was. And, and what, what came to my mind is the times in my life where maybe I was confronted as a young man or maybe I was dealing with things. And it, it wasn't that I verbally denied Christ as much as I just, maybe I didn't say anything, 
right? I didn't let myself come out of the bag that maybe I was a Christian or, or even a pastor or whatever it might have been. The one I do want to talk about was earlier on in Matthew. And this is where, you know, Peter is in, Jesus asked the question of Peter in Matthew 16. He says, who do people say that I am? And, and, and they say, well, you're this person, you're that person. But Peter goes, no, I, I believe that you are the Messiah of the, of the, of, you are, you are the Messiah. You are Christ. And Jesus turns to him and says, you know, Peter, that wasn't your own nature that came up with that. That was given to you by the Father. And so what you find here is Peter has this miraculous moment in time where it's like he gets it, right? It's incredible. It's one of those times that Andy uh, or Pastor Danny spoke about when he, when he mentioned Pastor Danny's sermon. I forget how I heard it. But anyways, about how he does all these wonderful things and then he has these bad moments, right? Well, not long after that happens, Jesus begins to pour his heart out to Peter. And as he's pouring his heart out to Peter and he's telling him, I'm going to die and this is what I'm going to suffer, this is what's going to happen... Peter decides, you know what, I just had this great moment. I know what's going on. He pulls Jesus aside and he rebukes him. That's not going to happen. I won't let that happen. And, and Jesus turns to him and, man, you got you to gotta wonder how Peter felt, right? I, I, you know, it's, it's not a good feeling when you're trying to do something right and you realize how horribly wrong it was. And P Jesus basically says to Peter, he says, hey, get behind me, Satan. And he says, you're a stumbling block to me. And what you recognize is, is that here Jesus really is all God and all man. And he doesn't want to have to go through what he's about to go through. And Peter telling him it's not going to happen and all this, that wasn't good for Jesus to have to hear at that moment in time. And he needed to correct Peter in that, and he did. But that's, that's Peter, right? That's who he is. He's life. He's full of life. He says things that are un unbelievably true, and he says things that, that sometimes are really shouldn't be spoken. And then Pastor Danny had a chance to speak about Paul, and I do want to talk about Paul as well. Paul was a highly educated Pharisee. Most likely, as I've read up about Paul, he probably had the Old Testament fairly memorized, which in and of myself is a marvel. And if you read Philippians 3, 4 through 6, Paul, he doesn't like to boast about himself, but he goes on this rant for a moment in Philippians 3. And he says, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. You see, Paul knew all the scripture. And yet at the same time, as a Pharisee, he didn't recognize in the beginning that Christ really was the Messiah. So he had the memorization down but he didn't know that Christ was the Messiah. He missed it. And when, as a result of that, what happens? Paul went around persecuting Christians. Paul went around dragging people out of their homes. And in doing so, he, there was many men were killed. And he stood by as, as Danny did a great job of, of, or Andy did a great job of explaining it. As he, he stood by as they laid the cloaks at his feet as they stoned Stephen to death. That's the Paul that we know. Saul became Paul. The next person I want to take a look at is Matthew. And Matthew, there's not a lot about Matthew other than we know he was a tax collector. And what's interesting is, is that in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is actually speaking and he references the fact that people came to see John the Baptist. And if they came to see John the Baptist, they began to say things about him like, oh, he was demonically possessed or this or that. So he was trying to, dis to disparage or to, to, um, to, what was the word? I had a great word for it. They were trying to discredit who John the Baptist was. And then in the second part of that verse, he says, yet the Son of Man, speaking of himself, came eating and drinking. And they say, look at this glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What's interesting about that is it's in the book of Matthew and Jesus is quoting it, but that tax collector they're talking about was, was Matthew, one of them. He was one of them. And in that day, and, and I know that it's been spoken of many times here at Bridge, tax collectors were not friends with the Jews. Tax collectors were despised and hated. What I found out, and I, it, I apologize, I don't retain a lot of information very well, but what's interesting is, is that usually the tax collectors were those that were already wealthy that had gone to the Romans and paid a sum of money to become tax collectors so they could make more money. 
Sounds like our government, doesn't it? Kind of strange. But anyways, so they give money to get money, right? I mean, it was really, really bad. So as a result, they were hated. So you got to think about this. You have this tax collector that nobody liked. You have Paul, who was a person who was really Saul, who you know persecuted the Christians. And then you have Peter, who was a fisherman. There are wide ranges of people going on here. The next person I want to talk about was Thomas. Thomas was also a fisherman. You know, Thomas, there's not a whole lot spoken about him as well. And what's interesting is that everybody knows his name, right? Doubting Thomas, right? And yet, that was really only one thing that Thomas did. He doubted that, that Christ had really risen from the dead when the other ten disciples told him that. What's interesting about Thomas is not too far before that moment in time, Jesus is going to go to, I believe it was, Jerusalem. And as a result of going there, everybody's telling him, don't go. Because if you go, they're going to try to kill you again, and it's a bad scenario there. And Thomas is like, hey, I'm in. Let's, go, let's all go die. Let's all go die together. And the reality of it is, is that Thomas was an aggressive individual. He was all in when it came to, to Christ. And yet, when you see those people that usually are all in, they're kind of all or nothing a lot of times. So how hard was the death of Christ on Thomas? Not, not taking away how hard it was on anybody, but maybe for some reason, Thomas, it was just something greater than he could bear. It was just something that he couldn't quite get his head around. So when the people came to him and said, Thomas, we've seen Christ, he struggled with that concept and said, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can really believe that or not. So we have doubting Thomas. And it, at the end of, the, of Thomas' story there, not the end of the story, but at the end of that particular passage, he says, I will not believe until I see the prints of the nails and put my fingers in the prints of those nails. Until I see the hole in his side and I put my hand in, in that hole. Man, that's an ultimatum, isn't it? I will not believe until. It's a pretty brave statement, a pretty bold statement. The last two people I want to talk about are James and John, both fishermen as well. James, John, and Peter were all called one, two, three in terms of becoming apostles. And what's interesting, they're all fishermen. And, the, and a lot of the, the commentaries you read talk about that they were really Jesus' favorites because they got to go see people raised from the dead before anybody else. They got to see other miracles happen that others didn't get to be called to. But they kind of went where Jesus went, Mount, Mount of the Transfiguration, that sort of stuff. So as a result, they called them the, the, the favored three. But when Jesus calls James and John, not too long after that, he calls them up and he gives them a name. And I'm not going to try to pronounce what the other name is because I'm going to mess it up and it's, I, I couldn't do it anyways. But the name basically translated means son, thun, sons of thunder. Sons of thunder. Now, you know, as you read that, you're like, well, gee, I wonder why they were called sons of thunder. I like one of the, the things I read. It said, well, it didn't take them long to show you why, right? Because what happens in, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus decides he's going to head back to Jerusalem. On his way back to Jerusalem, they stop in Samaria. Or they're going to stop in Samaria. And he sends people ahead to try to make place so that they can come and stay there. But when they come back, they tell them, hey, look, they don't really want you there because you're going to Jerusalem. And they know that you're a Jew. So they don't really want you to stay in Samaria. Samaritan. So as a result, James and John look at Jesus and go, hey, Jesus. How about if we call down fire and consume them all? Now, look, it wasn't like they did. All they said was, we don't want you to stay here. But they're ready to call down fire and kill them all. I mean, that was one of the reasons they said they, they probably called them, he was going to call them sons of thunder. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, Jesus didn't have to wait for that to happen before he called them that. Because Jesus knew exactly who they were, didn't he? Just like Jesus knows who we are. The next thing I, I like about... Um, the sons of thunder, is in Matthew chapter 20. Oh, I don't like it, but it's interesting. In Matthew chapter 20, you know, they're walking along, and Jesus lays out his heart about how he's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to be resurrected, and James and John have convinced their mother, and her mother, their mother's name, I believe, is Solome, and she was one of the, the, the women they believed helped take care of Jesus. And, and so they, 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 uh, they say to, to, to their mom, and they go together, and they say, okay, mom, we want want you to ask Jesus this question for us. And what's the question? Hey, when you rise again and you inherit your kingdom, we want to sit on your right and your left. Now, first of all, why are they sending their mom? They're grown men. 
They send their mom to go ask them a question. Now, I can tell you a simple story, but this is when I was in high school. My wife's going to kill me for this, but I apologize in advance, honey. I love you with all my heart. So when we were in high school, my dad might kill me too, but that's besides the point. I love you too, dad. So when we were in high school, my brother and I, we knew if we tried to call my dad and say, hey, dad, we want to stay out later than 10 o'clock. Is it okay? I wouldn't get through the word hello. And he, he would say hello. And I'd say, hey, dad, it's Scott. And he would say no. That was just kind of the pat answer, right? Because he knew whatever the question was, it wasn't going to be good. So what we would do is, Chester and I would gang up on Linda, because she was usually hanging around with us as well, and we would say, Linda, you got to call my dad, and you got to ask him. Now, hand to the Bible, right? Make sure I do this right. Hand to the Bible. I'm telling you the truth. He never said no when Linda would call. Never. Now, I was in high school. That makes sense. These are grown men that literally got their mom to go ask Jesus a question because she was one that helped take care of Jesus. The question, if you really stop and think about it, is this. And this is what struck me. Their question wasn't, was, God, we really want to be part of your kingdom. We want, to, we want to work alongside you. We want to be used any way you want to use us, Jesus. We just want to be a part of the team. That wasn't what it was. The question that they asked was, Lord, we want to sit at your right and left. We want to rule with you. We want to be in a place of authority and power. That's what we want, Lord. We want to have the same type of position that you have. You see, because if they were sitting at the right and left, that would mean that they were royalty as well in the king's court. That they would have others that would serve them. See, their heart wasn't to serve. Their heart was ambition. Their heart was to rule and to, and to be in a place of power. So what really qualified these people to be considered people of the way? Really nothing. Nothing qualified them to do it. I think we'll find some insight, though, in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 13, and I want to start reading it. It says in verse 8, actually, let me, let me preface this. Before verse 8, here's where, here's where we are in, the, in, in this particular passage of Scripture. After healing a crippled man, Peter and John are arrested, thrown in jail, and then brought before the Sadducees the following morning. And they were to give an account of under whose authority they healed the man. So let's get now into verse chapter 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, keep that in the back of your mind, says to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if, this, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I think Peter had an extra jab here, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any, under, uh, any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The key component of that passage starts off with, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to hold on to that nugget for a minute because we're going to get back to that. But now I want to read verse 13. Verse 13, I'm going to read it in two translations. I'm going to read it in the New King James and then the Passion Translation. The New King James Version says this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. The TPT Version says this. The council members were astonished and they real, excuse me, the council members were astonished as they witnessed the bold courage of Peter and John, especially when they discovered that they were just ordinary men who had never had religious training. Then they began to understand the effect Jesus had on them simply by spending time with him. You see, what I began to realize as I looked at these men and others as well, and I saw a lot of myself in those four or five men, is that it's not about who you are, 
but it is about who you're going to become. You see, the reality of it is this. None of them were qualified to be called people of the way. But what happens is, is that when you encounter Jesus Christ, when you spend time in the presence of God, whether you walk with him for three years, whether you encounter him now in worship, whether you spend time in the word of God, when you encounter and spend time with Jesus, it changes you forever. It changes who you are from the inside out. It makes you the better version of yourself. It makes you the person God wants you to be. You see, the reality of it is, is that God didn't choose them because of all of their qualifications. And I used to say that God chose them in spite of themselves, right? Or regardless of all of their poor choices and poor decisions and and poor character traits and, and all of that stuff. But as I began to read and really research it, you know what I think I would say now? I think I would say God chose them because of those issues. You know why? Because it makes you realize it has nothing to do with you and me. I can't ever earn it. I can't ever qualify for it. I can't ever make myself better that way. It has to come from the spirit of the living God. It has to come from the word of God. It has to come from inside. Jesus has to change you. The spirit of God living inside of you has to change you. That's what qualifies us to be part of that team. That's what qualifies us to be what's considered a person of the way. Where did this newfound boldness come from? Peter wasn't that guy at the crucifixion. None of them were. In fact, it talks about the fact that they all stood afar off as they watched Jesus be crucified, as they watched the trial. None of them wanted to be in there and be a part of it because they were afraid of what was going to happen. Because if they were identified with him, they knew what could happen to them. The reality of it is, is that something occurred in Acts chapter 2, right? And we know what that is. But before we get there, I want to talk about Paul for a second. Because Paul wasn't in Acts chapter 2. He wasn't in the upper room. He was still Saul persecuting the Christians for some time. But what happened to Paul? Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Paul had a run-in with God. Where did it happen on the road to Damascus? He's driving, he's, he's driving, he's riding along on his donkey or his his horse. And what I love about it is it's noonday, and Christ shows up brighter than the noonday sun. And he shows up so powerfully and so bright that it knocks Paul right off of his horse, or Saul right off of his horse. And what I like the picture is, the horse was fine, all the other people were fine, all their horses were fine, it was just Paul laying in the dirt face down. Right? Because that's the way God probably, I mean, if I was God, that's the way I would do it. But I'm just guessing, right? You, can't, you won't find that in any of the commentaries. But I would imagine that's the way it would happen. And he's probably looking up going, why aren't you guys on the ground? Why am I the only one on the ground? And then there's this voice, right? Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who, who is it? Who is it, Lord? He goes, it's me, the one you're persecuting. Why are you doing it? And then he makes this statement. It's tough to kick against the goads. A goat is a long, sharp stick used to prod oxen to make them move forward. So it meant that Paul was beginning to kick against something that he had no chance at winning at, his conscience. And the reality of it is, is that Paul was was transformed from that moment, which is why you see so much of the scripture that we read today in the New Testament comes from him. That encounter changed him into Paul. That encounter made him a different person. They still called him Saul of Tarsus. They still called him Paul. But the reality of it was, he was a changed man. And what I would submit to you today is this, is that the only way we're going to change as individuals, the only way we're going to become, truly become people of the way, is to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And what I love about it is it doesn't happen just once. You go to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and it talks about how they were all filled with the Holy Spirit all filled with the Holy Spirit. When you look at that word filled, this is the definition you get. They were entirely under his sacred influence and power. His sacred influence and power, meaning what? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the third person God. It was the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus when he was a man and living on earth is the same Holy Spirit that was inside of us and lives and dwells inside of us when we receive him as God. That, that they were entirely under his sacred influence and power. To be filled with anything is a phrase denoting that all the faculties are pervaded by it, engaged in it, 
or under its influence. I love that. I love that. And I love the fact that when you read about being baptized in the Spirit throughout the book of Acts, it's not a one-time thing. That you can be filled and refilled and refilled and refilled all over again. Isn't that awesome? I love the fact that God just has an unending supply of his presence and his spirit for us. I want to talk about Thomas real quick as well. Because Thomas was there in the upper room when the spirit of God fell. Thomas received the Holy Spirit. And yet even after that, when he's sitting with his ten friends that he'd been with for three years, he couldn't believe. He couldn't believe unless the ultimatum that he made was, was, was completed. And that's what I love about God's grace and mercy. That's what I love about Jesus. That he didn't have to, he didn't have to, he, he could have said, hey, look, I already appeared once to this. I'm not coming back for you, Thomas. You should just believe him. You should trust him. But instead, he shows back up when they're up in, in an upper room. Uh, I don't know if it's the same room. I apologize for that terminology. They're meeting together again, eight days later, seven days later. And as they meet together, the whole, the, 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 as they meet together, Jesus shows up. He shows up in a locked room. And this time Thomas is there. And he says, peace be to you. And when he says those words, he doesn't say anything else, but he turns and he looks directly at Thomas. And what does he say? Here's my hands, Thomas. Put your fingers in there. Here's my side, Thomas. Put your hand in there. Why? Because he knew Thomas. He created Thomas. He knew what Thomas would struggle with the rest of his life if he didn't have closure in that. He, he knew what Paul needed versus what other people... See, when, when they... I, I hate the terminology that says one size fits all. What does that really mean, one size fits all? Nothing is ever really one size fits all. Have you seen my head? When you get a hat that says one size fits all, it doesn't fit my head. It doesn't, nothing works on a one size fits all. Jesus isn't a one size fits all. And, and I think the reason that he's not is because he created us all different. And he knows who we are. He knows our strengths and our weaknesses and what we need in order to really get into a deeper relationship with him. And so what Jesus does is he takes and he puts on us the perfectly designed picture of who we are. And that's what he gives us. And he knows what we need. I mentioned a couple weeks ago when I spoke about my ADHD and how God knows sometimes when I'm praying, I wander off on trails. But he doesn't get mad at me for that because he knows that that's how I was made. He knows that's inside of me. See, nothing scares Christ. Nothing worries Christ. He made us this way. He knows our weaknesses and strengths, but he loves us anyways. And again, he creates and designs the perfect us and says, this is what I'm going to mold you into. But we can't do it by ourselves. We can't make ourselves fit that mold. There has to be an encounter with Christ. As I wrap up here, and I apologize, I'm going a couple minutes late. I want to read one or two passages real quick, and then we'll pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 says this, and this is out of the TPT version. Brothers and sisters, consider who you were when God called you to salvation. Not many of you were scholars by human standards. Not many of you were in positions of power. Not many of you were considered the elite when you answered God's call. But God chose them, but God chose those whom the world considered foolish to shame the things that were thought to be wise. When you turn to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to end with this. I want to, real quickly, on 1 Corinthians 1.26... I read that passage because I want to make sure that everybody listening and everybody watching understands at least one thing. It doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter where you were yesterday or this morning or last night, none of that matters. All the mistakes, all the issues, all the problems, all the, the, the character flaws and traits that you have, the bad morality, what, whatever issues you have in your life, none of it matters. None of it matters. God chose you just the way you were. You don't have to be educated. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to have all of the, you don't have to have it all together. None of that matters. God chose the foolish things to confound the wise. And he's chose you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul begins to speak 
And he says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, the point of all this is that we have nothing without the power of God in our lives. We have nothing without the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have to have that power to give us the strength to make the changes in our life that we need to make. We have to have that power of the Holy Spirit to keep us from temptation. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit every day of our lives to survive in the world that we live in. We can't do it by ourselves. And the beauty of it is is that God gives it to us and he gives it to us and we can be filled and refilled and refilled over and over and over again. I will tell you that I, I can identify with a lot of the men that I spoke about this morning, that I made bad decisions in my life and did things that I shouldn't have and opened doors that I shouldn't have and I nearly lost everything that I had. And yet God was there to forgive me and pick me up and do what? And to reestablish me. And what I can tell you today is it doesn't matter, as I said earlier, is that I'm not here to persuade you because I have all the perfect words. I don't. I'm not here to persuade you because I can can speak better than somebody else or, or, or make a better joke than somebody else. I'm not. I'm here to tell you that the only reason I'm standing before you is because of the power of Jesus Christ. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Not because I deserve it, but because he decided to choose me just like he chose you. And it doesn't matter where you are in your life. I prayed it earlier, and I said, all you have to do is surrender. That's that's all you have to do. He'll give you the power and the strength to change. He'll give you the power and the strength to become something different. But you'll never get out of it. You'll never change if you try to do it by yourself. So my prayer for you this morning and my takeaway for you this morning is this. is that you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But God will give it to you if you ask for it. He'll give it to you freely. And he'll meet you right where you are. And he'll make you the best version of yourself in every aspect of who you are. Because that's the people that are people of the way. They're people that surrender to Christ. They paid the price. They they took the shots, the hits that they took. Most of these men, if not all of them, all suffered and died persecution. We live in a country that usually that doesn't happen. And maybe you live in a country and you're watching from somewhere else where it does and you've you've made that choice. You've taken that that risk. And all I'm telling you today is why, why be content with where you are? We're coming up in two weeks for Pentecost where the Holy Spirit fell. He can start today, and it can go next week, and it could be bigger on Pentecost. All I know is, is that let's not, just, let's not be content with where we are. Let's pursue God. Let's change from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word because it is truth. I thank you for your faithfulness because you are true and you speak holy and you are faithful to us and you're faithful to your word. So this morning, Lord God, I ask now that if there are those in their home that want to make a change in their life. That God, as they raise their hand in the the privacy of their own home and say, I want more of you, that God, you would meet them right now with the power of the Holy Spirit. God, that you would fall and touch them, that there would be tears of joy and forgiveness, that they would sense your pleasure over them, Lord God, that they would sense that you love them exactly the way that they are. And that God, that those that need a touch from you, God, that you would move supernaturally. God, we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. We submit to you today, Lord God. We surrender our lives to you. We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. If you made that choice this morning, text the church, hit the contact button, as Pastor Andy said, and let us know. Maybe you're just praying for something else, but I encourage you to pray. And over these next two weeks, really begin to expect God to do something beginning today and really to continue it on into two weeks from now for Pentecost. Bless you guys. Thanks for watching.